we had five practices complete and we were doing really good in spring and uh, felt really good about the progress that the team was making and then all of a sudden uh, we were told to put it on halt and, and uh, to kind of send everyone home and I think everyone was doing that in the country was we were making adjustments and um, a, a lot of it was uncertainties. First reaction everyone had was like what's going on because like the pandemic we kind of heard news it got into the United States and then we're in Utah so we're like it can't really affect us too much our populations you know way smaller than other cities and then all of a sudden we hear one or two, one or two people and next thing we know you know everything's getting shut down. There was definitely some fear as soon as the Power Five conferences started to say hey we're shutting things down so the Big Ten announces hey, we're going conference only, and then we're not going to play college football at all, potentially, Pac-12 follows suit. In that moment, I was like, is this really going to happen? Um, and so maybe for like a glimmer of a moment, I thought there might not be college football this season. And I think some guys were like, okay, wow, well, like, you know, we really might not have a season at that point. Um, obviously, there were still some conferences that were still in it, and, and that kind of gave us some hope. Um, but like I said, we, we were preparing and, and, uh, and uh, working you know, as if we were going to have a season until somebody stopped us. Independence has always been a double-edged sword since we started a number of years ago. This year in 2020, it ended up being a really great blessing because we didn't have to play to the rules of a conference. When things started getting a little haywire, and a lot of co schools were having to do what their conference insisted or legislated, we were free to make decisions and do the things that we wanted. So we could schedule out, we could make our own decisions that were directed by what was going on on our campus. So even though we were very careful and cautious about the COVID situation for the health and well-being of our student athletes, we knew that if we were healthy that we could go forward real strong. I don't think there was ever any doubt that we were going to play a schedule. Um, we just didn't know how many games, but we knew we were going to play. I never thought that football wasn't going to have another fall. Even when it was like, even when all the conferences were like, we're shutting down and nobody's playing football. And every time you turn ESPN on, everyone's like, the house is on fire. I, I, for some reason, I just knew like, we're going to play ball. Even when we had been cleared to start practicing, um, I, I had a lot of doubts about the season. Um, conferences were, you know, slowly saying that they weren't going to play. We were losing games on the schedule, so there was a lot of doubt um, about about playing football. Uh, yeah, but but that's how it is. You know, it's it's all right. It was was just what happened. It was part of it. You know, we just Kalani really preached. You know, go with the flow. Like we'll figure it out. We'll attack each day as it comes. I mean, when the schedule blew up, there were a lot of thoughts going through my mind. And I think that even though there was some fear in my mind, I had to replace the fear with faith. There's just like, those are principles that we have learned from uh, way back. And you don't always have the opportunity to put them into practice. But there were times when I was a little scared. And I, did, I wondered what would happen with our season. And what if, what if? The players weren't able to play, and there were no games. How, how detrimental would that be to their future? And so you just pretty much had to put your head down and believe. You had to have faith and have the faith push out the fear. BYU was one of the programs at the leading edge of making the football season happen. Because as an independent, they could set their medical standards at the highest level and then move forward. And in doing so, and in having practices, full contact practices, et cetera, they showed other conferences, other college football programs, how you can have a safe football season with COVID. About a month before the fall camp and all that kind of thing started happening, I reached out to some of the guys on the team, some of the other captains, other guys that I felt like were leaders, and I said, you know, hey, how can, how can we get guys back in this mode of football? You know, everybody, everybody went home. Nobody's practicing anymore. No one's probably lifting. 
Um, I was like, how can we, you know, get everyone back and start doing our own our own practices and running together and stuff. And so, you know, about two three weeks before fall camp started, we got you know the whole offense, whole the whole defense back into Provo, and we started having our own player own practices. I'd print off scripts from spring ball. Uh, we would go through them. We would have one on one, seven on seven drills, and it was fully run by just the players. I think that really showed that kind of the pandemic and kind of what we went through. Um, it, it showed kind of the character of the guys that we had. Uh, a lot of guys were still putting in work, um, trying, to, trying to find ways to get together in small groups to get better, to run the plays. I know Zach um, oftentimes called the offense to get together, would run you know, a few plays here and there. And you know the defensive guys, like we would always, we're always on Zoom calls, we're always talking, finding ways um, to, to really just to get better. So I think it just shows um, kind of the character of the guys that we had on the team and how dedicated they were to getting better um, for themselves and for the team. Pilani Sataki talks about the way that his players will run practice at certain times of year. And he says that those practices are often the best ones that they have where the coaches aren't even there. They just let the players go out and run it. That's football character. It's personal character. It's leadership. But I remember just getting back in the IPF and starting conditioning and, and practices with the players. And, and it was just such a relief, you know, like some sort of normal, you know, and that's what we all wanted. We all wanted to play the season. So it was just we were a lot of energy, like one of the most energetic like off seasons I've been around when we were all together. I think the fact that they wanted to play so much and they took so much ownership individually, not just of their own their own position or their own position group, et cetera, but of the team overall, I think that is a big reason why this team came together so well. I think we went like two weeks into fall camp without even having a game scheduled yet. And so we were just practicing, you know, like if, if, if the time comes, we'll, we, we'll be ready for it. Maybe we'll play, maybe we won't. Let's pretend like we are. Uh, and so... Uh, we kind of just had to put that behind us and say, you know, regardless, we're going to be the best prepared team in the nation. And if we get a game, then we'll be ready to play. If not, then we got some good work in. We'll be ready for whenever the next opportunity is. When it came to the time for fall camp, uh, a lot of them weren't really worried about the schedule, even though things looked really gloomy at, at some point where we were the only ones that were playing football. I saw a, a group of, of young men bond together and then just relish the fact that they have an opportunity to be together and to practice. And so we knew going into it that it was going to be difficult to get the schedule put together, but uh, the players never lost hope. And, and I saw them improve and get better physically and, and definitely got better as, as, as a unit and brought us closer together the, during that, that time that we had to take off. Tom's always been a man of his word. Um, and so when he had said, you know, that we were going to play 12 games, um, I, I knew deep down that we were going to, that he was going to find a way. Uh, it, didn't very, it didn't seem very realistic at the time, and Kalani had always said, hey, Tom's telling me he's gonna play, we're going to play 12 games. This is what Tom's saying. Tom's saying we're going to play a, a full schedule. And so uh, for me, I think it was, it was pretty easy um, to believe Tom and, and to trust that he was going to make it happen. All these teams seemed like in a matter of days were just gone off the schedule all at once. And, and then the question was, who would BYU be able to play? If the Cougars wanted to play, who'd be able, who'd be available? Um, and that, that became the next big question. The unknown of who we were going to play was a blessing on the scheme side because it forced us that we don't know what we're playing, but let's get really good at, at what we want to do. And we simplified things and really mastered some of the stuff that's at, at the core of our offense. And I think that was a huge part of the success we had. Tom was always open with us. Tom would be like, hey, we're getting these teams to like play us. Like, oh, we're like, oh, that sounds great. And then it falls through. And like, those are these powerhouse teams that we never like got to play. So like we try to control what we can control. And whoever hated on it sucks for them. You know, it's like we don't care. We tried to get the best schedule as possible. It's not our fault. It's not our fault you guys chickened out, you know? It's definitely not our fault. We only cared about like what we can control. We had games before it blew up, not scheduled, not contracted, but that we were talking about. We had games that were penciled, not contracted, with Alabama, Texas A&M, Oklahoma State, and a number of others, Ole Miss, where 
they needed games if they could play. Now those games fell apart because as it turned out, their conferences ended up having restrictions on just playing conference games or you could maybe play one non-conference game. So before they made that decision, they were working too. And it, again, it was really cool to see such great collaboration with so many different schools. There was, there was still a lot of nervous energy in the air with, uh, I mean, for us as coaches, we were preparing at one point for Alabama. And I remember that, we were kind of pulling up their film and start watching them, start breaking it down. Then it's like, okay, we might play these guys. So we pulled up their film, start breaking them down. And, um, you know, that was, that was a little nerve wracking, but at the same time, it was just nice to be able to say, okay, it sounds like we're gonna play. And whoever it is, we'll be grateful to be playing. And we saw on Twitter, and I was freaking out. I was like, let's go, Alabama. You know, like the opportunity to play the best SEC team, one of the best programs in the history of college football. It was it was a roller coaster because I got all high. We're going to play Alabama. And then, oh, wait, never mind. You know, any time that we heard something that somebody said, like, hey, but it's not, you know, official yet. we got to keep it under wraps. People would post, like, the eyeballs, like, you know, hey, something big's coming, check it out. And then once everybody kind of caught on, then everybody would post, you know, the eyeballs. And it just became, like, this this funny thing that we would all do. And, and it became something that I think the administration and the coaches thought was silly because they told us not to say anything, but we didn't. But we did still, you know. Jake Oldroyd from BYU, number 39, will put toe to leather. BYU wondered about its season, and now it is underway. Tim Daly Ford in Spanish Fork sells Ford vehicles, including the F-150, the pickup designed for work and play. Tim Daly Ford maintains a large inventory, providing more choices for selecting an F-150 with the power and engineering to carry and tow heavy loads. The F-150's design offers comfort, safety, and a range of options to choose from. Think Ford. Think Tim Daly Ford in Spanish Fork. Hi, Spencer Linton here letting you know when your company joins the BYU team as a corporate partner, your brand can be featured in sports programming on BYU TV and BYU Radio. In addition to all of the great games, you can be part of the BYU Coaches Shows, place your message in Countdown to Kickoff, basketball pre- and post-game shows, and each weekday on BYU Sports Nation. We invite your team to join ours and become a corporate sponsor of BYU Athletics. For details, email sponsorship at byu.edu today. BYU Food to Go's convenient location at 2191 North Canyon Road in Provo makes bringing popular BYU foods to your next event easy. Everything's ready when you need it at the drive and load pickup. You drive in and they load no matter the weather. And stop in the on-site creamery for great BYU chocolate milk and ice cream. BYU Food to Go, bringing campus to your table. Call for details, 801-422-5001. You're not the new coach. Are you expecting somebody different? Last time you coached was 12 years ago. I was hired to teach the boys a game of basketball, and I did that to the best of my ability. I play, coach stays, he goes, I go. No school as small has ever been in a state championship. I want to win for my dad. Let's win for coach. You got us here. I love you guys. There was a lot of social injustices and racial inequalities going around in the in the world, and and uh, you know we have you know count we have countless you know my, minorities on the team and and guys that you know were kind of feeling feeling a little bit down, and um, we we uh, we wanted to take it upon ourselves to to meet as a team and and to uh, just just express our support and and you know our love for for one another and and to help guys understand kind of how we're feeling. Uh, during that time, and um, we felt like, you know, what be what better way to to uh, kind of bring awareness than to put a message on a shirt that that's going to be obviously viewed by hundreds of thousands of people on game day, and and uh, just to spread a message a message of you know how we want to live life and and just the culture that we that we live by and, and the way that others others should do as well. It was a really awesome, awesome opportunity to be able to wear those shirts and, and kind of share with the world, you know, what we believed as a team, but also what we believe as a church, you know, is to, to love one another as Jesus did and, and that we're all 
brothers and sisters, we're all family, you know, we're all trying to to return to live with our Heavenly Father again, you know, and that's the main point of this life, you know, is to love one another, help each other progress, and to reach our eternal destinies. Yeah, we were able to fund, I think, 63 scholarships um, through all those, uh, through the purchases that, that, you know, people had made of those shirts. So it was just kind of one thing led to another, and, and we just kind of rolled with it, but that was uh, one of the most, I think, the most cool experience that I've had um, here at BYU was, was just seeing everyone rally around those shirts and what we were able to do with those shirts. It's not choosing one agenda over another, it's just choosing to take care of people and to love people and that is something that we could all rally around. And so once again going back to the simple part of the gospel of Jesus Christ and being disciples, I, I think this was an easy the easy thing for me to sign on uh, with and, and, and allow the players to do. And then the fact that the proceeds allowed, uh, were able to help uh, form scholarships for other, for students in need, that was really um, fulfilling for our team. You know, unveiling it when we went for our first game on a, on a Monday, which was the only game being played against Navy on the other side of the country. I mean, it was, everything just, uh, just played out perfectly for us during that time and the way that we delivered the message. BYU and Navy open their seasons in a game that's only been on the schedule for about a month. And there will be challenges tonight. The stage is different, quieter, no fans in the stands. The Cougars and midshipmen get set to square off in this bizarre season that has already made an impact far beyond the field. Until kickoff happened, you just wondered, okay, is this actually going to happen? Is this game really going to take place? Because there were other games across the country that were literally getting to the day before and, oh, there's a positive COVID test. we got to shut it down. So the moment that that ball kicked off, I just felt such an overwhelming sense of gratitude and joy to be watching a game that matters to so many people. Strength for them a year ago. They need to kind of step up and make some plays here. Katoa is getting into the secondary. He's got a chance to go, and now each of the two BYU running backs have found the end zone, and they are absolutely gashing the midshipmen. I would say the weirdest thing is when I, I was able to, uh, like, have a touch. I was breaking away to go score, and I hear nothing. <laughs> and so I thought for sure there was, like, a penalty or something because that roar that, that I heard the season before, like, when you take off and you're about to score, you just hear like this big roar from the crowd and you know like, okay, yeah, you're good. So right when I scored, I, there was this dead silence. I just turned around. I thought there was like a flag or something, but I was like, oh shoot, that's just how it's going to be this year. There's no, no, no fans. We were going to be kind of our own cheerleaders um, and our own crowd and really boost each other up. And so, you know, very brief meetings. Um, which is which is pretty unique. Usually, you know, you you have a lot of adjustments to go over, um, a lot of conversations going on. So, those were all very short, very brief, and everyone was back up cheering on the offense, and the offense was cheering us on. And so, uh, that was that was unique. I think that was also one of the most unique things about our team is uh, collectively as a group we were kind of our biggest cheerleaders. I think we definitely wish our families and fans could come and support us and to cheer. But at the end of the day, we knew we had each other, and, man, we had a blast, if you couldn't tell. We were excited. We had fun in all the games, cheering, dancing, and having a good time, and we just made the best of the situation. Yeah, it was super weird. Like, when we can communicate with the other team across the, the field, it was so weird. When you could hear what they're saying, it was totally weird. But, I mean, I mean, but like Kalani said, like, like he like before every game he taught us a new dance move to do during the during the um the game and so we would just always have that juice like internally and we'll be able to like just pump ourselves up i think uh west right and that uh you know him dancing and going viral type thing i think that was one of them um and i think just the kicker celebration i think the camera needs to focus a lot on the kickers and the special teams Specialists that don't get a lot of the attention. Uh, they they have their own fun and their own way of doing little things. Um, but I think just watching them and how excited they were, and they only play maybe two snaps a game. How fluid our offense was uh, for the punter. Uh, they I think just watching those guys celebrate when they were able to contribute to the thing was was super awesome to see. 
I've never been in a bad mood and danced. You know what I mean? So I just feel like dancing gets you in a good mood. And, and I wanted our players to be focused on, on just having fun. And, and, and uh, I think sometimes when you're getting really nervous before a game and the butterflies are starting to build up, I, it's kind of a, a good relief to get out and boogie a little bit and maybe even look a little foolish, you know, by, by dancing. But I, I think it, it allowed people to kind of relax a little bit. Yeah, I love, I love Kalani for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's, I, I can't imagine a ton of coaches go about um, pregame like that. Um, and so when he first started doing it, you know, I, I was kind of confused, but then I realized, like, why he was doing it. Um, you know, there can be a lot of, a lot of jitters and nervousness and anxiety um, before games. And so when he'd, you know, bring us up and, you know, not do the typical, like, hype speech and stuff like that and just, you know, get us loose and um, just ready to have fun. And, you know, the game's supposed to be fun. And so he knew that. And um, I respect him for, for going about it that way. Yeah, so actually my first touchdown against Troy, Kalani said, hey, we need to be dancing. We have no fans there. Let's get out there, have some energy. I want all the boys dancing. And so I was like, okay, I don't have any dance moves. Like, what do you want me to do, coach? And right after he said, okay, I got one for you. Just go like this, use the cabbage patch a little. And I was like, okay, like the cabbage patch, it's not even... That's not really cool, but of course I'm gonna listen to my coach, so I decided to do it after my touchdown, and then everyone was clowning me for it, saying like, oh, it was a dumb dance, old and stuff, and I was just trying to follow my coach's advice, so. But I, I, I failed to tell Isaac to not do it on the football field, and he should have got a penalty for it, but I think it was all in good fun, but I, I mean, I afterwards I'm like, hey guys, this is we're not gonna do the dance moves while we're out on the field, but. Um, I think, I think mission accomplished of what we wanted to get done. Let's kick off AFR on BYU TV. What they did in that fourth quarter was not unexpected in my book. Everyone did their job perfectly, and it resulted in obviously a touchdown. Who knew that he had these kind of hands? And right at the snap of the football, they both go right downhill. And, and that was the end of that. <laughs> he, did, he, he knocked him down pretty quickly. I know what it's like to be overlooked, to be doubted, to fly under the radar. I only had one offer coming out of high school, but I was ready for every moment, every opportunity, and every shot that I got. Now I'm playing professional basketball, aiming to be one of the best shooters on the planet. And I'm just getting started. Be ready for your moment with Rapid Reboot, the future of rapid recovery. Our fans all across the country always show up to whatever whatever place we're playing, um, and so it was so fun to just see people that support us out there at the game. Um, it was special for me because I'm from Texas, and so my family got to go to that game in Houston. But yeah, I, I definitely felt a little bit of the the butterflies, you know, when when you step out there for the first kick and you got a few thousand people there watching you do it. Um, but that's one of the aspects of the game that I love the most. I think Houston was it was a big defining moment for us because we we showed that, you know, in in the past we would get down and we wouldn't come back up and then just to show that we had more grit and more fight and 
more ability just to stay calm in the hard situations. I thought it was a, a huge, a huge win for us and, and helped propel us throughout the season. I felt like we made some really good second half adjustments, especially in the locker room. We uh, we did some personnel change and I, especially on defense, I felt like we did a great job of like figuring out what they were trying to accomplish and then, you know, mixing it up. I remember there was a play that Zach did that um, we were like, hey, we should try this. We didn't practice it all week, but everyone has it. Like, it's like a normal twist yeah, where we twist the, the ends and the tackles. And I remember we were just like, hey, this is going to work. Like, I don't think they can do it. And then during halftime, we were like, all right, let's do it. Coach, Coach Elisa was like, yeah, let's just run it. And then Zach got the sack on that, and we're like, oh, dude, this is awesome. That's Algier in motion into the backfield. Wilson. Little silver pass and Lake's in. Touchdown, Mason Lake. We practiced it and practiced it, and like we just went through all these scenarios, and then we got down and crunched in like the crunch time in the game, and I was and they called Chiefs. I was like, I was on the sideline. I was like, oh, jeez. So like, and so I was running in there. I'm like, oh my gosh, Mason, do not mess this up. And I just so pretty much essentially what I did is I I'd go to block the guy. Zach would roll out, and the guy would run with him, and I'd just throw him. And I went to block the guy, and he was kind of just sitting there, and I was like. You gonna go? You gonna go? And he he wasn't going. So, I finally just I, I I chucked him a little and turned, and the ball was like right in my face. And Zach was scared. Zach almost didn't throw because he thought I wasn't gonna be ready, but he threw it and it was just right in my face. And I caught it and just got vertical. But it was a super special moment for me and um, a huge part of the game. You know that was actually one of the first games this past year where I actually felt like it was loud. You know they had fans in there. It wasn't fully packed, but it kind of gave you that glimpse of what 2019 was like. It was it was loud in that stadium, and I don't think people give Houston the respect they deserve. You know they didn't end the end the year as well as they could have, and I don't know if they just they played super well against us. But you know that was a good team. They were they were super talented, and you know we were going back and forth. We we got up on them quick, and then they got back up on us, and we get to the fourth quarter, and we're trying to you know separate. We're up by three. And you know we're able to throw a touchdown, you know, to Dax um, in a critical situation. And you know what an awesome, you know, s you know, stamp that was to end the game. It was one of the first games we had in front of fans, and there were a ton of fans for them. Houston was a cool place, and I got to, um, I got to show that undershirt I, when I scored that touchdown. I got to show um, that undershirt I had, and just being able to do that for my mom was really special, and um, just got my story out there and. And I finally told people about it. I, I think the Houston game was the one that really kind of showed, you know, BYU could be truly for real. That was a good Houston team with some pro talent. And it was on the road. It was a marquee position in terms of national broadcast. And, uh, you know, being down the way they were, BYU, uh, shows how good Houston was on that night and required a pretty big comeback to get that win. Beyond the fact that Zach Wilson played so well in that game, made so many great throws, kind of launched himself higher in the draft conversation. I thought the Houston game was a big game in a lot of, in a lot of ways for Zach, uh, for the team, and in, in kind of a bigger picture perspective of, wow, this could be a really special group. You can tell what someone's in the zone when they're, when they're operating the way uh, Zach was. Um, to be able to just stay within the scheme, trust anyone who was on the field, didn't have someone who he trusted more than the other. Um, he, let, he let his play... Um, kind of take over and didn't have to go off of any bias or um, anything on his own train of thought. So it makes it, it makes our job really easy as coaches. Yeah, I remember my freshman year when he started playing like against Hawaii and against NIU and he had some of those plays that were just amazing. I'm like, man, I love blocking for this guy. I, lo I would have loved blocking for anyone, but to be able to block for someone like him was special. And I knew he was special from, from that point on. People in the media were talking about, oh, it, maybe it's someone else. Maybe we, they should play someone else. He shouldn't start. I knew Zach was special from, from that point on, and, and I knew once he was healthy, he was just going to light it up. Even before the season, we knew what Zach and that offense was capable of, and so it was just really kind of putting it out there, you know, taking shots on the field, taking chances, and, and same thing for our run game. We had a really strong run game. And so just as a defense, knowing that your team could put up points, I think it allows you to go out there and, and really kind of just play instead of having your backs against the wall. Um, you can go out there and play and, um, and know that your offense is, if we, can, if we can get the offense the ball, they're going to score. Just like we did back in the day when BYU's offense was state of the art, it's now state of the art again for an old reason. Because you can stress linebackers and safeties with tight ends and with running backs. I, I love the, the big plays and being able to throw it all around the field. 
and that was something that we talked about you know from the beginning of the season we we talked about how our offense was going to be aggressive and how we were going to we were going to take shots and we were we were going to air it out and i think that we did that the whole season and it, as a receiver that's that's something that you, you love to play in that type of offense nostalgia in the air through the fans and everything and everybody be able to see you know the ball up in the air for 60 yards and all that stuff and that's that's uh, everybody knows that's BYU football. Um, I knew that growing up, you know, and so it's it's been fun for us on the defense to just be a part of it. There's a lot of teams out there that are that are playing, you know, marginal defense with a marginal offense, and we're trying to just be a team that keeps up on the defensive side as the as the offensive side. And our offense is playing really, really well. It's just shy of a first down. And then to Tyler Algier. Algier has it up and has a hole. Algier is on his way. He's pounding the blue. And he's headed for Painter. All the way for a score. Opening kickoff. You get the ball at the 20-yard line. You're like, okay, we're going to go grind it down, you know, go score real quick. Um, usually eight, nine play drive, maybe more. And we're just going to run the ball down there and, and go score. And, and then the breaks open on the second second play of the game. And I'm just there looking up, seeing Tyler Algier run for his life, you know, for the end zone. And I, I couldn't have been happier, you know. So it was one of our, one of our bread and butter plays. It was, uh, it was just a regular wide zone, and you know, just everyone washes down. And then we got the tight end, tight end from the backside, and you know, everything washed down. They played their defense. They had their D line washed with our own line. So you know, there was just an open cutback lane, and then. The tight end, uh, I believe it was Mason or Rex, but the tight end ended up really doing a great job doing, like just washing him down, and then it was just a, just just that cutback lane, and then just sort of gashed it. It was a road test against the top 25 team. Um, people were kind of, you know, doubting if BYU had it in them, like we didn't have the schedule, but we we knew we were good. We knew we could play with anybody, and so we went in there and just and just dominated that entire game. And that game is it was it was one of the games where you just know everything's going right. And so you're just having the most fun you can have out there. It was, it was a good time. Kalani Sataki's done everything right with this group, and they've been a great example in college football of how to go forward with a will to play and a joy to play together. And we saw that here tonight. We knew, we knew how good we were, but we knew that the whole country thought we were playing nobody. And so this was our first ranked opponent, I'm pretty sure. And it was Boise State. Um, already is a rivalry, so we were already excited. And yeah, when we took the field against them, there was no question who was the better team that day. We can now add Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to a list of places BYU football never thought they'd go in a wildly unpredictable 2020 college football season. Yet here we are on the beaches of the Atlantic Ocean for the second time in four months. Keep in mind, the idea of BYU versus Coastal Carolina isn't even 72 hours old, and they have pulled it off. When you look at the skyline of Myrtle Beach, it's easy to notice the iconic Ferris wheel, and it's, in a way, a representation of how BYU jumped into this game. Off goes one passenger, Liberty, with COVID issues. In steps the next customer, BYU, for a top 20 showdown as they move on to their next ride. I thought it was a joke when they first announced that. I, I, when they said, oh, yeah, we're playing Coastal Carolina, and I was like, it's freaking Wednesday. Like, what are we talking about? Coastal Carolina had an open date. BYU had an open date. Then a couple of phone calls later, bam, they had, they had the game scheduled. But even before the game was officially scheduled, BYU knew that it might be, and so they loaded up the trucks with the equipment, and they sent them off to Myrtle Beach. The BYU equipment truck had like this national following as they made their way all the way to South Carolina just so they could get there by Friday to set up for a Saturday early afternoon game, late late afternoon game. And I, that whole experience was wild. It wasn't great for us to play Coastal Carolina on the road in three days notice. I knew it wasn't great, but if we didn't do that, it wouldn't have been the great game it was. If they hadn't, if we would have won the game, they were willing to take that chance too. I think we took a little bit more of a chance, but I think our players and our coaches wanted to go for the gusto. And at that point in time, that's what the gusto was. Do I regret it? No, I, I loved that we, you know, on a whim, 
f- flew across the country, played football, gave it our all, gave it our, you know, if you, you, you go back and watch the film, it wasn't pretty um, scheme-wise, but the effort and the heart and the intensity was there all four quarters. But every defender's heels on the goal line, and you be ready to knock it down. Last chance for the Cougars. Mel the catch, wrestled down on the two. Coastal wins it. That whole game, we were we couldn't catch a break. Like it was it was bad. But the fact that it like with how bad we played and and with, with whatever went wrong that game, and just to see that we came just inches away from, who knows what would have happened if we won that game. And it's, it's, it's terrible. It was a terrible feeling, not going to lie. Like, that playing at home was awful. Everybody knew what we missed out on when we lost that game. But at the same time, I thought it was, was really cool to show, like, the fight. Like, it took, like, what, two, three guys to hold uh, Dax Mill. And, and a little shade against Dax, that's my boy, but he's not, he does not weigh that much. And it took that many guys to keep him out of the end zone. Like, that just shows, like, our fight. And it was bad, but when I thought back on it, I was like, Wow, that's that was actually a special a special moment right there. Coach Fessy, you know, he told me what the play was. He said it was coming to me, and um, he said make sure to do these things. And um, I was ready for it, and came the 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 play came down to it, and I did everything that I thought you know I could do, and they were just they were just there, and I. You know, I've watched the play a lot and to see if I could do anything different. And honestly, I can say I, I, can't, I couldn't do anything different. They were just ready for it. Um, they had multiple guys ready there. So it was a great experience going down there and, and playing in the short notice we did. But I'd want that one back if I could. If you could replay any game, whether you won or lost, which game would it be? Coastal Carolina, for sure. <laughs> The Coastal game, I, I wish we could redo. Obviously, Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina, for sure. Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina. Yeah, for sure, Coastal Carolina. Of course, it would probably have to be uh, Coastal Carolina. No doubt, Coastal. No doubt. My name is Spencer Finnegan. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. During my sophomore year, I got married to my sweetheart, Mary. And there's tons of unexpected expenses when it comes to marriage. We were looking for scholarships. I found the replenishment grant, and my local alumni chapter gave me a grant to help me focus in on school. I'm so excited to now that I've graduated, give back to those students that are coming to BYU in the future. One thing Mountain America has learned over nearly a century of helping members achieve their financial dreams is that we are stronger together. We achieve great things together. And while we are still here to serve you, we know together feels different right now. It might take some time, but we're looking forward to the day when we can gather together again. We're still here, guiding you forward. Introducing the all-new 2021 Nissan Rogue. A fuel-efficient car that's compact enough to park just about anywhere, but has enough cargo space to fit your hobbies, your kids' hobbies, and your dog's hobbies. It's equipped with the latest safety and efficiency technology for a smooth and quiet ride wherever you want to go, whether it's through the neighborhood or across the country. Are you ready to rogue? It's at Tim Daly Nissan Southtown. We're both very competitive. That's a definite strength in regards to the show and competition. My name is Pamela Bright, and I live in Socher, Mississippi. And my name is Christine Sherman, and I live in Stockton, California. We're, We're twins. twins. We've always known there was a potential older sibling. And um, we're hoping to meet, you know, possible biological mother and biological father. It's a little nerve wracking because you're just not knowing really what you're walking into. Yeah, but we're ready. Yeah, we're ready. We're ready. You know, uh, probably no surprise to anybody that uh, 18 to 22 year old guys aren't really afraid of uh, viruses like COVID, right? And so um, the part of that was like education. We have to educate them to, okay, well, here's what uh, the, the medical experts and the government is saying, not just for you guys to protect yourselves, but uh, you know, if, if perhaps we slow the spread between us, then maybe there's advantages for society. 
it just kind of became the new norm. It's like everyone's doing it. Everyone bought in. Um, we had that um, week where we didn't play Army, unfortunately, because you know we had some of the, some of that stuff going on, and so we all bought into hey. We have to wear a mask. We have to test if we want to play football. And we didn't want to get that taken away. We didn't have roommates. We had to wear masks 24-7. We uh, social distanced, testing every day. Like We had to go through a grind to, for the season. Like It was not just given to us. We had to really work. When you're, when you're dealing with, with, a, with a situation where we get to play football and others aren't, I think there's just this deep level of appreciation. And so it didn't really matter what was gonna happen, whether we had to eat our food to go and, and we couldn't sit at the table together with our teammates, um, whether we had to be separated by hotel rooms, one person per room, things like that. I mean, we, we were gonna do whatever it took to, to play the game. Yeah, you have to stand your toes. Um, that's something I've learned a lot last year is who knows what could happen and just kind of roll with the punches and get through it. You know, I'd say as a football team, every single guy on the team was like, you know what, like, I'll do anything to play. <laughs> you know, we don't care what the rules are, the restrictions, like, we're going to do whatever we can to be able to play football this year. And so, you know, as the year went on, we just kind of did whatever we could, and we'd have to listen to the rules to make sure we could just stay on the field. You know, guys sacrificed going out on the weekends and stuff just so we could play football. It got stale really fast, but, you know, everybody had an understanding that, um, you know, these th certain things that were done were just done for the for the good of the of the community, the good of the world, and we were all on board with that. One thing that we we always said was that we were going to be as one, and uh, we had we had countless you know meetings as players and and just just to get on the same page and, and let people kind of be vulnerable and, and speak speak their minds and whatnot, and and uh, that's a big reason why we were able to come together and and be a strong unit. You know, usually in normal normalcy. Uh, you know, guys, a lot of guys can get distracted or be worried about, you know, social aspects or what they're going to do after practice or, you know, what they're doing that weekend. And so um, when when we had to be careful and, and um, you know, not hang out with the outside world as much, um, you know, we had nothing else to focus on but football. And so I'd, I'd for sure say there was a that heightened the intensity and focus of, of our program. I totally changed the game. We were... Even in practice, we practiced a lot more guys, just in case. We, we even played a lot more guys in, the, in previous games to get experience just in case. The whole team started to play football rather than just you know the, the 40 or so guys that are in packages to start with. And our team was all over the place in terms of depth. But um, you know Kalani really prepared us for that. We strengthened a lot of the younger guys, and people stepped in and stepped up to the plate when their name was called. So it was pretty cool seeing that happen because we, we definitely had some, some depth last year that could handle that job. The biggest challenge by far was just knowing like, who was going to be available each week to play with COVID testing. So you could, you know, you're building a game plan and then you find out, you, you could find out the day you're leaving that these two or three guys are out and then you got to adjust. I got sent home the Western Kentucky week, I think on a Thursday. So we'd already had the game plan in, already practiced and everything. And so it's now it's switching around who's in the press box, who's on the ground, who's coaching this position group, who's going to make up for this slack. And, and, uh, and so, you know, another, another coach ended up, Coach Lamb ended up calling that game. And it was, it was a lot that was put on his plate to go back and start watching film for the next two days in, in the mind of a coordinator. You know, just things were a little bit different because he was already doing special teams. and. And uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> it was, uh, it was a, a wild ride going through all that stuff. That's just something that you never do <laughs> when you're getting ready for a regular football game. But now we're saying, okay, if this coach is out, this guy's calling it. And really what, it had, to be, what had to happen was everyone needed to be ready to call a football game. Uh, not just on the, on the full-time staff, but even the graduate assistants and analysts. They just, we just never knew how the testing was going to, re the results of the testing. But... We need to go through worst case scenarios, and um, and we had to deal with it. That was just part of. It. We never went into a game where we were full strength with players and with coaches. Kalani, he's preached a culture of love and learning since I've been here, and he preached a, a culture that really emphasizes the importance of family, um, and that you know that's why we were able to adapt so well to um, COVID when things were shut down. Is we had players reaching out 
uh, making sure everyone was okay. We had players looking after each other, uh, players visiting each other, and really showing that family environment, that family culture that we've established for so long here now was, was showing that, that it does exist and that it's real. I, I know my job as a, as a football coach is to win games, but that's not my focus. And, and, and allowing our players to play at their best and, and, and encouraging them to play at their best and preparing to play at your best. Uh, and if you can do that, you can live with the results. You know, everybody kind of put the team first. We didn't have unselfish people this year. And so even though, you know, people weren't getting the stats they would want or, you know, it was, it was going to someone else, nobody really cared because as long as we were winning, everybody really was unselfish and put the team over themselves. My motivation is to help, and then I can tell that um, everyone has this connection to wanting to get better and to learn as much as they can, and I'm excited that, that our players are bought into that. And, and then to follow in, in the example of our Savior, and that, that's to love people and, and to respect your opponents and to play with sportsmanship, that stuff matters, and it's, it's, it relieves a lot of stress to, to, be, to have our guys do that in competition. Quick crack. Wash all you want. Don't drive dirty. bugging me about getting the BYU Sports Nation karma. He's coming this way. Let's go. Hey, guys. special here. Hey. Uh, I've been looking for you guys. Uh, I can't talk right now, Coach. We're going to be late for the show. Jerem, Spencer, there you guys are. They all want the karma. Go, 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 go. Hey, man. Hey, I got a golf tournament this weekend. How about some of that karma? From Waikiki at the Hawaii Bowl to the South Florida beaches here in 2020, who could have guessed what would have happened in the last year in BYU football? Jeremy, at the end of this week, will BYU have more or fewer than three games on the football schedule? Yet the Cougars scheduled who they could and thrived. That's right, BYU just announced moments ago it will open the 2020 football season at Navy. Yeah, let's in go! In Annapolis, Monday, September 7th, Labor Day. Just like who would have thought we would have even had, had the opportunity just to play just one game, but you know, we were just able to really just ball out and do our own thing. And then now look at us now aiming for 11 and 1. And made it a season we'll never forget. Oh, Wilson is going to uncork for the end wow. zone. And he drops it in beautifully. And it is his roommate. These guys want to be on the field and they want to play this game. They've worked for hard for it, just like everyone else has. But I really feel good about this group. They're unique, you know, and, and, and uh, different. This season is just very unique in its own way, right? Just dealing with COVID um, and, and just all the adversity that we faced this year. Um, obviously, this is a special group of guys and, and everybody in the organization has done uh, their part in, in contributing to the success of the team. This season is definitely gonna be one, you know, for me to remember and, and for a lot of people to remember just because of the way that it's, the way that it's gone and, and the success that we've had, so. Look, BYU wanted to go to a New Year's Six game. We all wanted them to go to a New Year's Six game but it didn't work out. 
So BYU will continue to do what it's been doing all season, make the best of the situation. And at 10-1, and ranked 13th, with a quality matchup with UCF in the Boca Raton Bowl, BYU is trying to cap off a special season. Everybody on this team knows that uh, it's going to be the last one for this, this specific group of guys. So each one of us just wants to play for the man next to us and, uh, and do everything we can, lay it all on the line. If we show up at our best, and I, I really have a good feeling about it. And, and uh, that's another motivation to do something that no other BYU team has been able to do before. Wilson steps up, throws a little off balance, lofts it up. What a catch on the near side. Oh, my goodness. Lopini Katoa with the catch of the night. Katoa, this is nasty. Look at him lay out for this thing and get almost parallel to the line of, to the field and go get that thing. Oh, man, Katoa. Who is the field on the previous play has catch it, resulting in a first down. Game, in the bowl game, you know, I was, I was in, and I ran a route, and I turned around, and Zach lofted it up to, to Lapini Katoa, and he made that Superman diving catch. And, you know, that made ESPN and stuff. I, it, was, it would have been funny if a camera would have seen my face on the other side of the field. It was just complete shock, just jaw drop. It was, it was amazing. That was one of my favorite moments. I think at that point there was bowl games that were being canceled and whatnot. Um, and so just to be able to play another game and to continue a special season was definitely, definitely uh, something to be very appreciative of. The best part was just to go out there and play a really good football team and play really well. And uh, I think that was just the icing on the cake of a great season. You know, UCF was a great team, has great players, but we came out and really showed the nation, okay, we are a legit football team. We have legit, you know, depth, coaches, players, and uh, we're, we were playing, you know, definitely at a P5 top, you know, program level. You know, it was like one last game. You know, a lot of guys knew um, who was leaving, who wasn't going to come back. We knew this was the last time as a team, the exact same team that we'd have together. And so it was, it was really special that we got to go out there and just and just blow those guys out from the beginning. BYU is going to win this one by 26. Their average margin of victory this year, 28 points. Second best in the FBS, only behind Alabama, who won their games by an average of 30 points. I always remember our team being thankful for the things that they got and then um, never taking things for granted ever again. The, the, uh, the love that each of us shared for each other and, and the way that we kind of showed it on game day, just going out and playing hard for the, for the person next to us, um, I definitely think it was a special season in that sense and uh, something that I know that each team, if, if they want to be successful, has to have. You can't. I mean, it's hard to, to operate when, you know, guys are kind of just going one way and, and one way and another. Like, there's, there's got to be a sense of strength and unity in a team to be, to be great. It always brings a smile on my face, you know. It's a, it's a year that's changed my life completely. Improbable things are still possible. Uh, when everyone in the summer was kind of saying football can't happen, it won't happen, it's impossible, you, you can't do it, uh, BYU and so many other teams showed that, well, you can do it. It's about sticking to what you know um, you know you're good at and getting better at it and not trying to overcomplicate things. It's about valuing um, chemistry and, and camaraderie and you know being around each other and how important those things are. I was going to go work out at, at the school. Obviously it was locked, so I had to work out in the grass and the sand and stuff. you know We got the sand pits and bags and things because I was just getting ready for the season just like I always do. And when I got out there there was like there's like 11 dudes out there already. And I'm like, oh, we have a special group of guys. When you get a free pass to go do whatever you want and not work or whatever, and, you know, sometimes you kind of feel like, well, I'm, I'm going to grind anyway because that's who I am. That's, and then you get there and there was like tons of dudes doing the same thing. I'm like, okay, we got something special here when you don't have to be here. There's not nobody watching it, and there's tons of dudes out in the sand pit jumping around, throwing things, You're like, okay, there's a special group here. When difficult situations arise, you can always accomplish more when you do the work together. And that was a perfect example with the team. 
there were some people on the pro in the program, maybe some staff, maybe some individual players that were a little bit unwinding. But when COVID came, we had to come together. If you didn't, you wouldn't survive. And I think that experience of bringing everybody together for success should carry over, but you have to make it happen. We have an expression in athletics saying, it doesn't just happen. You just don't end up being number one or being highly ranked or going to an NCAA tournament in any sport. It doesn't happen. You have to make it happen. There's reasons that it happens. And we'll, we'll take some of those things that we learned this year and use them in the future. A lot of the things that BYU is doing going into the future have to do with the way the 2020 team came together, the leadership, the brotherhood, the love, the new ways of doing things and looking at things have turned into programs that will help future BYU football teams. We got to prove that we're still a good team and, and it wasn't just a one year thing. And we've got to prove that we've got players that can step up and replace the guys that have left. And that's a fun challenge. I'm excited about it. We have players that, you know, are. We're special, but we have more special players that can come up and, and fill those responsibilities. Oh, I'm, I'm excited for the schedule, personally. I think we have a good chance to show what we're made of and to, to show what's been going on here at BYU. I think you can legitimately say that the 2020 season was the greatest in BYU football history. And 1984 was the national championship, and certainly it was the pinnacle in terms of success on the field as defined by championships. But in 2020, BYU had to deal with a completely unprecedented situation, a pandemic where there was no blueprint for what to do at all, much less what to do to have success at the highest level. And yet BYU didn't just blaze the trail for the rest of college football to follow as to how to have a successful and medically safe college football season. They also succeeded at the highest levels. They were one yard away, one yard from having a perfect season on the field on top of it. And I think the love and the brotherhood and the success that they had in that unprecedented challenge means that 2020, can legitimately be called the most impactful, the most memorable, and probably the greatest football season in BYU history. The snap, the turn handoff to Algier, a hold to the left, Tyler near side, 25-20, the 15, the 10, the 5, the dive, the touchdown! Tyler Algier! Pulls it away from Algier, settles in a clean pocket, now hit as he throws, deep down the near side to Dax, Mill makes the catch, he's gonna go! 40, 30, 20, 10, and just like that, BYU on top. Shotgun snap to Zach, gives to Tyler. Tyler starts in, busts out, and has a hole. Second level, and he could go. 40, 50, the Cougars are going to score on their first possession. Algier 20, 10, and touchdown, Cougars!